Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Bakke Paul. Now, Dr. Paul is a board-certified endocrinologist and also has a master's in nutrition. And she's the metabolic disease director at Capital Family Medicine and the medical director of the Lifestyle Medical Center in Raleigh, Durham. Now, what makes Dr. Paul really special to me is, is one, her journey. She's had this journey of, you know, being an endocrinologist, but not being trained anything about reversing or putting type 2 diabetes into remission, not trained at all about low-carb nutrition or use of CGMs for that purpose. But now here she is uh, on the cutting edge, really, of treating type 2 diabetes. And she has so many uh, wonderful clinical pearls about what she does to help treat people with type 2 diabetes, that this is an episode for any doctor or, or PA or nurse practitioner, anybody who manages or treats or works with somebody with type 2 diabetes, because there are so many clinical pearls. But at the same time, from a patient perspective, there are so many tips and tricks and tools that you're going to learn from this as well about things you can talk to your clinician about to help manage your type 2 diabetes. We talk a lot about the role of nutrition, but we also talk about the role of exercise and how important that is. We talk about different types of nutrition, and we talk about tools and ways to get uh, gratification and reward and and knowing that you're doing a good job and seeing your progress and how important that is um, for treating type 2 diabetes and practical tips about how to, how to factor this into your clinical practice or how to factor it into your lifestyle um, and ways to see success. So this is a, a, a great... Um, I'd call it a masterclass on, on the new treatment of type 2 diabetes, not, not the way people have been trained, but the way people should be trained now, a new way to see the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So Dr. Paul, I've got to ask you, it, when in our discussion offline, you said you are a newly blossomed lifestyle <laughs> endocrinologist. And I just love that term. I had to grab onto it and say, I'm starting the interview with this term, a newly blossomed lifestyle <laughs> endocrinologist. So first, tell me what you mean by that. So I, I got my fellowship in endocrinology in uh, 2010. And um, I have always had interest, in, I've always been interested in uh, lifestyle medicine. But honestly, during my fellowship, I did not get the training I thought I would. I was really trained to be a prescriber, and I was taught to look at diabetes as this very progressive disease. And in fact, one of our preceptors would say to patients that if I did my job right and you did your job right, you will live long enough to eventually need insulin. And it was not until very recently, about a few years ago, 2018 to be exact, where I came up with the realization that not only was that not true, but in fact, when I was prescribing basal insulin to a type 2 diabetic patient who is very much capable of making insulin, but is just not responding to it, I was actually being part of the problem and not part of the solution and was actually making things a whole lot worse. And this did not come more clear to me than this one patient that I was helping, um, very pleasant uh, patient that had um, insulin-dependent diabetes for a long time, and I had to keep raising his insulin doses to a point where I needed to transition him to U500 insulin, which if you're not aware of what that is, it is five times stronger and the most strongest insulin that we have. But then he went on a ketogenic diet, and within a month, he was off all his insulin and his A1C was in the fives. So that's why I call myself a, a newly blossoming lifestyle endocrinologist, because I think it was not until very recently where I um, have um, transitioned from thinking of diabetes, you know, from the lens of lifestyle and not from, you know, the lens of just this progressive disease that ultimately will lead to insulin at, you know, at any, at, at, at some point. Yeah. And that, that's such a powerful story because, I mean, because of exactly what you were taught, right? If they're lucky, they will live long enough to need insulin. Like that is just mind boggling. But yet this is someone who is a, a, in a position of power and a position of teaching. And, you know, you can argue, well, they're just a shill for the insulin company. Okay, that's probably not true for the majority of people teaching that. Or you can say, you know, they just... They, they themselves were never taught lifestyle, but yet the guidelines always say, start with lifestyle first. And the, you know, they give it maybe a paragraph and then they have pages and pages of, of information about medications. But why do you think the ability to 
prescribe lifestyle has been so slow to catch on as like something that actually can work and actually can help people and to be like part of the, the first thing it was part of the public conversation. Why do you think that's been so slow to happen for so many of your colleagues? I think, I think the, one of the biggest challenges is we've always been taught, I think through medical school and, you know, through fellowship that, if we want people to change, we we have to give them knowledge, and uh, that comes in the form of information and handouts, and that really doesn't work for lifestyle. I don't think we've 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 been taught what really works, and I think what works is approaching lifestyle from a feelings perspective, not from a knowledge perspective, and this is where really a patient needs to feel that they can. They need, they need to see something, to feel something, and that's going to fuel change. And that is not what we've been taught. So even for me, um, it was, I think it was hard for me to prescribe lifestyle without also prescribing a tool where a patient can see firsthand, you know, the immediate gratification, the immediate reward system that they can experience. Because I think ultimately that's what we want. That's what fuels change is not the delayed gratification, but like if I make a, if I make a good choice right now, how am I going to be rewarded in the next five to 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, there the game changer was the continuous glucose monitor. So when I was in fellowship, CGMs were always prescribed uh, from, from the lens of hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia and awareness for patients uh, who were who on multiple doses of insulin, you know, to sort of assist them in how to dose it, but never from a place of lifestyle. And I feel that is where it is most powerful. I think it helps people not require insulin and other medications, you know, as opposed to, I think we have it backwards uh, in this country. You know, we, we prescribe all these tools after the fact, but I think I think they can be very helpful early on. Yeah, I think that's a great point because when you talk about what is the motivation for someone with type 2 diabetes to really stick to a lifestyle, I mean, one motivation is to not have an amputation or a heart attack 20 years down the road, right? But you can't see that. You can't feel it. Like that's not going to get it. And even like you said, three months to wait three months for an A1C, that's a long time to see if what you're doing really works. So that's a great point about the power of the CGM. I mean, you could say it's a shame we're in this instant gratification type of society now where we need to know right away, but without judging it, it is what it is. And the CGM can be a really good tool for that. Now in your, in your training, I'm sure CGM was for, you know, people with type one diabetes to adjust their insulin and to prevent hypoglycemia. And it's like a whole new concept about using a continuous glucose monitor to really pick and choose the foods that, um, that work best for you, right? The quote unquote, healthy whole grains, the, the fruit salad, which is inherently going to be healthy. Well, we're starting to learn that maybe that's not the case for all people. Um, so do you have to do a, a lot of educating and a lot of sort of like reframing people's perspectives about that? With diet? So I think, you know, the, the first um, question that every patient with type 2 diabetes has, no matter where they are in their diabetes, is, is how possible is it for me to reverse my diabetes? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's because I think what happens is, some of the most, uh, I think, distressing diseases with your doctor is a disease with diabetes management, especially when you're placed on the wrong medications, where you are, we're just setting patients up for failure and we're taking that hope away from them, right? So, so it gets really hard to sort of then ask them to do something um, when we have actually been giving them the wrong impression this whole time that, uh, you know, your diabetes is one of, is, is a disease where it's just a failure of medications and we just need to add more and more. But instead, I think if we tell them that's never the case uh, at any stage of your diabetes, but, you know, why don't we try something different? Why don't we try a different approach? And, and let's just try it for seven days. You know, I don't want you to feel you have to do this for the rest of your life, but let's, add, let's answer a preliminary question, which is, what would happen to my numbers if I followed a very strict low carb diet? So what if I did not eat carbs for one week? Can I also then come off my medications in that same week? What happens? And I think it's important to look at that blueprint of diabetes 
off carbs, off meds, because it just, it just, it's such a great way to then embark on a journey with a patient on, okay, how do I make this more sustainable long-term? But I think you need to answer that fundamental question first, especially for the patient. Yeah. And you're talking about the instant gratification. I mean, seeing your glucose is one and coming off your medication is another pretty quick gratification, but can be also potentially dangerous, right? I mean, a low carb diet can be so effective that when you're on medications, your blood sugar goes through the floor. And if you're a doctor who sees your patients every six months and you don't have the logistical structure to really work with somebody on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour kind of basis, that can be challenging. So how do you work with your patients to make sure they're safe when they go on a very low-carb diet and are on insulin or SGLT2 inhibitors or sulfonylureas or other medications? Right. Great question. So I think the first thing I did, Brett, is um, after I came to the realization that uh, low-carb diets are really a game changer for patients. I did the diet doctor uh, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction course. And and the thing that I got most out of that course was not only how to prescribe a low carb diet, but how to start the deep prescription journey. Because up until that point, all I knew was how to add more medications. So that was really important for me. And I would recommend anybody who's listening to this, um, and especially if you're caring for patients with diabetes, that that you certainly look into that course, because I think it was a very valuable piece. Um, Because, you know, you need to to get a start somewhere. And it's just hard to go to conferences and and learn about that, because we don't, uh, about how to take people off medications there. So anyways, so that's where I started. Um, And then um, you are absolutely right. When it comes to um, a low-carb diet, especially in a patient who is taking any medications that puts them at risk for hypoglycemia, it has to be done in a very safe manner. And this is, again, where I think CGMs come in very handy because a very underappreciated piece of a CGM is its ability to capture data and to remotely give us the data that we need. So, for example, when I see a patient, a new, a new patient with diabetes, as I said, my first objective is to get a blueprint of their diabetes, off carbs, off meds. So what I have the patient do is I have them do this seven-day carbohydrate sensitivity test where I basically have them follow a 20-gram ketogenic diet, and their immediate payoff is I get rid of any diabetic medication that does not support them. And the reason I can be so bold is because I am remotely monitoring the numbers multiple times a day in that first week. Uh, And if I have made a really big mistake, I can promptly reach out to the patient and have them resume whatever medication I need them to resume. But again, what I've gained is, is, is a patient who, for the first time in a long time, feels hopeful that maybe there is a way to treat my diabetes with lifestyle. And that feeling of hope is going to motivate them to keep on going. Right? And then there are the additional perks. At the end of seven days, their hunger is so much in sync with their body's needs. They feel so much better. They hurt so much less. And, and, uh, and they realize one very important thing. They realize that a really efficient way to bring down your glucose is to actually use your body. So again, back to the CGM, I think one of the best things about the CGM is the CGM's ability to give us trend arrows. You know, not only does it tell you where your glucose is right now, but where it's heading. So if I told you, Brett, your glucose is 110, but then I told you, guess what? Your glucose is 110, but it is rapidly on the rise. Now that changes that number, right? So you are probably going to eat a lot more wisely than originally planned, just knowing that it's on the rise. And if I told you there's a very easy way in which you can make that arrow either either come down or you know come back to being steady by just you know drinking water and becoming active and when you see that for yourself you know seeing is believing you're more likely to use your own body to lower your glucose again and again and again right so so i think i think seeing is believing and um, um, and also to do things safely you think i think you have to use technology to your advantage too which i think we can do in this in this in this day and age yeah, I like how you're talking about the arrows, whether the the trend arrows are going up or going down. It's such an important concept. And the use of, of physical activity and nutrition together. You know, have your meal one day, have your meal one day, and go for a walk right afterwards the next day and see how you can lower that that rise of your glucose. Um, that that makes a lot of sense too. But now, so you, you said a, a very low-carb ketogenic diet. 
20 grams of carbs per day. Now that's, I think, clear that that is going to be the quickest and most effective uh, means of getting someone to lower their blood sugar and get off medications. But is that what's required for somebody to improve their, their diabetes? Or is there sort of a broader concept that maybe a clinician listening to this who says, I'm still not on board with ketogenic diets, or right. a patient listening to this saying, I don't know if I can do that extreme of a, you know, quote right. unquote extreme of a diet. Is there a middle ground that can still kind of work? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I use the ketogenic diet just for that first week when I am, because again, I want to I want to try to get rid of as many confounders as possible so I can get a patient's diabetes for what it is, right? So I can see what the numbers are doing on a 24-7 basis. So then when the patient comes back in seven days, now I know when they're, when they're most sensitive and when they're going to be most uh, resistant to carbohydrates. You know, you can see those numbers because you, you get a sense of their glucose pattern. So this is where... I will get, have the conversation with the patient. You know, I'll first ask them, so based on your experience for the last seven days, where do you want to go? Uh, you know, what's your next leg of your journey going to look like? Do you want to just stay on this? Or do you want to start adding some carbs? Now, if you want to start adding some carbs, let's not guess. Let's make an educational decision about when and how, many, how much carbs to add. And so the first rule is obviously we're not going to add carbs that are, you know, we want to add the, the good carbs, right? I mean, the carbs that are going to give you some benefit, uh, especially uh, carbs with fiber in them. But it's important to start slow. So maybe we just start with one carb serving with each meal or with the meal where you most desire it and where you're least likely to um, run high. So this is where we, we start talking about protein. So, you know, we start your meal with a protein, especially if you want, if you desire a carb and depending on your carb and um, how your glucose spiked, if it did, you know, you want to make time to be physically active. So I've had so many times when patients have told me it was just not worth it for me to eat that carb because I knew I didn't have the time <laughs> to be physically active afterwards. So, so I think, uh, I don't think you need to be on a ketogenic diet um, long term. Um, uh, obviously, it depends on your goals and the severity of your diabetes. And um, um, I think it's a very good starting point because it answers a lot of key questions for the patient and the provider. Uh, and it sets you up at a good foundation. And then you can build on that. Yeah. I think that's a good point. So the other concept, though, is you talked about reversing your diabetes. And there's been lots of of discussion, I guess, in social media and in the literature about reversing diabetes versus diabetes in remission and what does it mean? And there was just a sort of a new consensus statement about, you know, having a A1C of 6.5 or less off all medications is remission. And I was sort of scratching my head, like wondering if that's really the best goal or not. And, but you have said before that it, it's sort of like a, it can be a combination of lifestyle and medi medications that it's not, you know, lifestyle, the goal is to get you off all medications and anything else is a failure if you're not off all medications, exactly. but there can be sort of like a, a coexistence. So tell us more about your philosophy about how you use lifestyle and medications either separately or together. Right. So, you know, so first to answer your question about reversal um, and remission, I think, uh, I think the most important person to ask that question is the patient, right? So when the so, for example, when the patient comes back um, at seven days, uh, and, you know, the great thing, again, with CGM is I have access to the computed A1C from the data. So I can see if their A1C is below 6.5 or not, and especially if it's below 6.5 and it's, and it's off medications at 6.5, I do tell patients, yes, you have reversed your diabetes, but we still have a lot of work ahead of us because what we really need to get into next is we have to rewire the circuitry that got you to this place. And in order to make this change permanent, we have to work on habits and we have to see what is sustainable and what's not. So this is where I come up with a maintenance plan, a reset plan, and a rescue plan. So, And, and this can be both lifestyle uh, and medications or just lifestyle. So uh, for a lot of people, uh, especially if they're early on their diabetes, they're just on one or two oral drugs, it's, it's relatively easy for them to maintain their reversal just on lifestyle on most days, except when their cues change in the environment. So, you know, the holiday season's coming up or they go on a vacation or, you know, God forbid they got sick um, and their sugar's on the rise. So I think uh, at that time, 
uh, lifestyle may not be enough. They may need another tool. And this is where I think medications can be immensely helpful. So especially with the SGLT2 inhibitors, I think they're really good reset drugs because you know it's the one class of drugs we have that actually get rid of glucose from your body. They don't they don't just move the glucose around in your in your body, you know, from blood to cell, cell to blood. It's it's actually getting rid of it. So I think it's very helpful. And and when a when a patient is using a CGM, when they open the app, they get to see the last 24 hours of data. So they they get to see in the last 24 hours what was my time and range and what was my average glucose. And and if those numbers don't line up to where they want it to be, they can go ahead and take an SGLT2 inhibitor that morning. And what they will notice is they reset quickly. And that, again, builds their confidence, right? So it can get frustrating if you keep going down and down and down. It's, it's hard to get back up again. So why not do a 24-hour reset when we have the tools to do that? And on the same note, I think every patient with diabetes needs to have a rescue plan. And, 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 and a rescue plan is something that will work no matter what. And, and this is where I think... There is a lot of um, utility in short-acting insulin, rapid-acting insulin, which is very different from long-acting insulin because, you know, there are going to be times when your sugars are going to go up, and especially if you're placed on steroids or if you get really sick or if you're very, very stressed, things happen. Um, and it may be hard for you to use physical activity and other things to bring it down. But this is where I think uh, rescue insulin can be very beneficial. And, uh, you know, you use it when you need it. Uh, you at least know how to use it when things are good. Um, and uh, then when you're back on your maintenance regimen, you don't need it anymore. So I think it's, it's, the way, it's the way our patients look at these different tools that matter, right? So people don't want to be dependent on medications. But, it's it, you know, I have had no problem convincing patients to at least think of these in the right context. Uh, because ultimately, you know, patients want to do well and they want to stay in their target range as long as possible. Right? Yeah, I think that's a, that's really great how you define the maintenance or the rescue and a, I guess a unique way of using medications. And because I think most people just think of here's your medication, take it every day, see you later. Right? It's so much easier as opposed to designing specific circumstances where you could take a medication this day and not the other days. Now, what do you think is holding back more clinicians from taking an approach like this, an individualized, personalized, uh, more focused approach like you're taking? Because I mean, let's be honest, I, I, there are a lot of endocrinologists out there. There are a lot of people managing diabetes. And I think you are in a definite, definite minority in the way you are approaching it. So what is the major hurdle for most docs to, to have a practice like this? I think, I think the two main hurdles are time and availability. So, um, you know, I used to be one of those endocrinologists that had to see patients every 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, it was very, uh, it was a very much numbers driven practice. And I did not have any availability to see patients for three months or six months. And, and I had to sort of you know, think about, I had to take a step back and I had to think about, okay, what, what kind of a life do I want and how do I want work to fit in that life? And more important, what kind of, what kind of work do I want to do? And so I had to make a decision for myself to move from a very big organization-based practice, which was very numbers driven, to a community practice where I do get the time to spend with patients. So I, I at the very minimum, spend 30 minutes uh, per patient. Um, and I had to basically take on patients that I was able to support for a 90-day period. So it was not about just seeing the patient, a new referral, and that's it. It was about, if I take this patient on, am I able to guide, coach, help this patient? Patient over the next 90 days. And so I had to completely change the structure of my work environment to do that. But it was very, very fulfilling. And, and you know, now I think the next challenge is, okay, how do I keep up with the demand? So this is where maybe now you sort of look into getting a, getting a team and sort of start training the team. But I think those are the two main barriers that you are going to have to address, you know, sooner than later, the time and the availability barrier. Yeah, and you alluded to it that when you are able to make this kind of change, it changes how you see yourself as a physician and how you get enjoyment out of your practice. And I mean, you've got a beaming smile. Were you always this chipper and always this happy and all the always this this fulfilled with your practice, or did you see a, a definite transition? You know, I definitely saw a transition. I mean, I always was a cheerleader for my patients, um, but I I don't know. It was 
it was it was challenging. It was so challenging to talk about these things in a in a you know eight minute visit. And it was it was you know especially when you are trying to sort of switch habits. That's that's what takes time. I think I think giving the knowledge doesn't take time because most people come to you with the knowledge, right? It's how do we help these people sort of implement the knowledge with the obstacles that they're facing in their own lives. And I think that takes time. Yeah. Um, and uh, and also, how do you do it in a way that is where the patient is very honest and upfront about what's going on and, and what are the barriers they're facing? And obstacles change at every visit. You know, it's not the same thing that the patient has to experience. And and it's better for them. That's when they need our support is is to figure those 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 things out, right? And um, and and you need time for that. And in addition to spending time with patients, I think it's very important to also have time for yourself outside of patient care, where you can sort of you know assess your um, your workflow and assess you know the the information that you're del- delivering, the way you're delivering it. Um, you know, are you are you able to help patients or not? And you have to keep. I guess adapting. So I'm probably on my version six or seven, and I've only been doing this for the last, you know, uh, three years. And you know, it's going to keep evolving, you know, based on the new information that I learn, you know, from your podcast or from books that I read. I think I think it's important to carve out that time with patients and also outside of patients. Yeah, and I, I really like that conversation about revitalizing your practice. You know, we've seen it with so many physicians. We had an interview with um, Dr. David Unwin. And he gives a dramatic example. He was ready to retire. He was ready to give up his practice. And then he revitalized his practice in a similar way, using low carb and seeing the benefits. And, you know, the, it seems like I've heard more about physician burnout in the past, certainly five years and certainly in the past two years, more than I ever have in my entire life. And I can't help but wonder is if a big part of that is not having the impact with the with your patients that you wanted, not having the time to spend with them and not seeing the improvements you wanted to. So, I mean, you lead a, a wonderful example of, of a perfect way to sort of break out of that and practice in a way that's that's meaningful to you and meaningful to your patients. But yet still there are doctors listening to this going, well, I can't do that. You know, I'm part of my big group. I don't want to take the risk and go out on my own. Um, and I, I know this might be a difficult question, but are there little things someone can do in, if they're still stuck in that, I call it the hamster wheel kind of practice where you have to see patients every 10 minutes, where it's all about the numbers, where you can't take the risk to, to do something grander. Um, what, what advice do you have to them to ways that they can improve their practice and their, their, um, impact on their patients? Wow, that is a, that is an interesting question, a very important question, and I wish I had the magical answer. Um, I think the important thing is probably just to kind of see see what is the one change you can make, uh, no matter how small it is, and to maybe do it consistently and see if you can even delegate uh, some of this. So um, I know for me, when I was trying to do this in a, in a 10, 15 minute appointment, I would use videos and um, every time I found myself repeating myself, I would either make a video or a handout out of it. Mm-hmm. And I would figure out a way to... Um, to uh, sort of give that information outside of my eight minute appointment. So the patient still had access to it, but then I would try to do that before the patient saw me. So then the, the eight minutes are spent in me sort of troubleshooting with the patient, right? So it's not, it's not going over their medications and their, uh, you know, labs in three months and things like that, but more about, you know, okay, you just, you know, what, 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 what what was your takeaway from that video and how can I help you? What's the one right. step that we can take together today? Um, and maybe starting there. Um, and you'd be surprising how much um, a lot of doctors are looking for that one person in their practice who actually is going to help them with all this. Because, you know, I'm part of this primary care group and uh, um, when I'm helping my colleagues, patients with lifestyle, I'm actually helping my colleagues as well, because even those visits become pretty, you know, seamless. Um, So I think you might actually end up getting more support than you think you do uh, at this point, you know, so, so maybe just come up with some kind of workflow, start small and, and don't aim for perfection. I think that's one of the problems with doctors is, you know, we tend to be, we, we, we tend to be super achievers. We want things to be perfect right from the get go. And and sometimes that doesn't, I mean, it really never happens. So just starting somewhere, I think, um, I think is a, is a good place. But again, I think you, 
the first thing is going to be the time factor. Um, right. You are going to have to find that pocket of time where you can try you can try doing something different and that's the pocket of time where you are going to have say, you're going to have to say no to other things that you could do at that time instead right. like seeing more patients or documenting or meetings or right. whatever right. it is yeah but i love that idea just because you have a five minute visit an eight minute visit doesn't mean that it has to be the only educational opportunity for you and the patient if you can make something a little more evergreen like if you get the same question over and over again a five minute video, have them watch it before their visit. I mean, that's, that's a great idea and pretty simple to do. Um, and that's sort of what we're trying to do as well at Diet Doctor with our DD Pro membership for clinicians to really sort of take that burden off of them and provide the knowledge and the expertise and the content um, so that, that the clinicians don't have to. But even if you're, you're not a member of DD Pro or have something similar that you can be a member of, you can do it yourself. Just a simple video, have them watch it before their appointment. Um, or a handout or whatever the case may be. I, I like that because it's not just the five minute visit, um, which right. is great. Well, and one other one other thing that I have done that has been very helpful is group appointments. Mm -hmm. So if you have, and this works well, not with those very complicated diabetic patients, but maybe the pre-diabetics or people with newly diagnosed diabetes that are not on medications yet. So one of the things that I have done is I will I will do like a Zoom appointment with all these patients, you know. So and the advantage there is you can get eight patients on board and you spend ninety minutes. But for the patient, it seems like you spend the 90 minutes with them and it gives you the opportunity to go into details about everything. And it creates a really good medium for patients to learn, learn from each other. So, you know, at the first visit, we talk about um, low carb insulin resistance and we get everybody started on a CGM um, and, uh, you know, how to use it. And there are going to be some patients that are very nervous to do it. And, but when they see the other, other patients put it on, they put it on themselves too. So maybe even starting with a group visit once a month yeah. um, and sort of picking your patients well. So not picking patients that have all flavors of diabetes, but just like the easier ones first where, where, where you don't have to um, sort of micromanage a lot on an individual level. I think that would be a good place to start. Yes, yeah, so these are great tips. So any clinicians who are out there listening, you can implement these in your practice tomorrow. I mean, these are easy to implement. And for the patients out there listening, you should tell your clinician about these practices. Either have them listen to this podcast or just tell them yourselves what these practices are. Because I mean, let's, let's be honest, you're not being taught this, right? No one taught you this in your fellowship or in your CME courses or in the big conferences. Like you had to be proactive and learn this on your own. And then hopefully your voice can then become one of the educators to help your fellow clinicians. But it, it takes time. It's slow moving when you go this way, as opposed to from the top down. Um, so we've eventually got to get it to the point where it's the top down, but this is certainly a good starting point. I want to transition for just a second because you have talked a lot about the benefits of CGMs and it's clear from what you said, there are lots of them, but some people would argue the opposite and say, well, a CGM makes people too hyper-focused on their blood sugar and it makes them do anything possible to lower their blood sugar. Sometimes maybe not the healthiest things like, you know, an all fat diet, hundred percent fat diet, it's going to be wonderful for your CGM, but it's not going to be so good for your protein intake and your, your whole macronutrient composition. So, um, I get that's obviously the extreme, but that's sort of the, the counterpoint to CGM. So I guess my question is, have you seen some of this, um, maybe unhealthy hyper-focus on the CGM and what do you do to sort of counsel people about that? That's a really good question. So yes, I mean, one of the issues with CGM is this overwhelming nature of incoming data because, you know, every single minute you are figuring out, you know, you're, you're seeing your sugars, you're seeing where you've been, you're seeing where you are. And there are so many factors that influence your glucose levels. Uh, and you get to see all of that firsthand. So I, I always, um, I encourage my patients to always focus on the big picture. Because if you get lost in the numbers, it's not, you're, you're going to lose the lesson. So I talk to patients in terms of the target range, not the actual number. So I will set a target range for every patient based on what their goals are and what, you know, what, what I'm trying to accomplish with them. And we always talk about, let's get back to the target range. What is helping you stay in your range? What is help, what is making you leave your range? You know, what is helping you get back in your range? Um, and when, when I move the conversation away from actual glucose numbers to target range, I think 
I, th I think it's very beneficial for patients. I think it, it, it sort of helps them a lot. And, and another thing with, uh, with especially for, 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 for the providers that are listening where, you know, they have prescribed CGMs and they notice that patients are just not scanning as much, where they're just using a CGM like a glucometer and just checking the glucose in the morning. I think one of the, one of the key things to talk about with patients when they're using CGMs is what should a patient do when the numbers are not in the target range? Because when you're, when you're in the target range, you feel great, you feel validated. There is no doubt about what needs to be done, but it's when you're not in range, which is where confusion begins. So I think reviewing with patients, you know, if your numbers go above your target range, this is what I would recommend you do. If your numbers go below your target range, this is what I would recommend you do. So I think let, you know, not, we should not have the patients figure all that out on themselves. We need to train patients into understanding what these numbers mean and how they can use this number, how this information to, to switch their habits. Yeah, so you talked about ranges, and I really like that, focusing on a range rather than an absolute number. Do you have sort of set ranges that you use, or is it really individualized? What kind of advice do you give people about the ranges? So, again, it depends on where where the patient starts out. Um, so if I have a patient who, you know, whose A1C is 13 or 14, um, you know, a, a glucose of 100 is going to feel awful for that person, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're going to be crashing and, you know, uh, that's not where I want them to be. So for them, maybe a higher range would be better. And then I think what I try to do is I try to customize uh, the range. Um, if I am seeing, if I'm seeing somebody with prediabetes, I typically like their range to be at 70 to 140. Um, the, um, the international consensus guidelines on time and range recommend that we, we help our type two diabetic patients and our type one diabetic patients achieve, uh, you know, 70 to achieve 70% of the time in the 70 to 180 target range. Now, I think that's a little bit too big for my comfort. So I like to, I, I like to I like to um, um, change it a little bit, uh, maybe even do seventy to one sixty. But again, it all depends. And and also, it for me, I am I am trying to build the patient's confidence. So if I notice that I have created a target range that is very unrealistic for a patient, uh, I think the best thing for me to do is to change that range because I want the patient to feel like they're getting these quick wins, right? I, I want yeah. them to feel like they're making progress. And so I think it's a moving target, you know, the time and range. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Um, and now how does weight loss factor into all this? Do you think weight loss is a good primary goal and something patients should focus on? Or do you think it's more about improving blood sugar and weight loss will follow? I mean, do you, do you counsel patients one way or the other about, about monitoring their weight? How important is weight loss? You know, I don't focus as much on weight loss because I, um, honestly, it's because I think I need to learn more about how to, how to, how to address weight loss with patients. I, I feel very comfortable with diabetes. And, and you know, um, I think a very critical piece of weight loss is looking at a patient's medication list. And to not, I think there's a lot of inertia with doctors where if, you know, there, there's this thing about, okay, if, if it in broke, don't fix it. <laughs> but that, that really backfires when it comes to weight. I mean, there's a lot of medications out there that promote a lot of weight, especially in the di diabetes realm. Um, so I come at weight loss from a place of medication adjustments uh, more than anything else. And I focus more on waist circumference over weight loss. And I think anybody, I think any provider out there who helps, who, who helps patients with diabetes should check a patient's waist, especially uh, if you're prescribing insulin or sulfonylureas, because the weight may not change, but the waist circumference will. So um, the focus in in my conversations with patients is is more on you know waist circumference, is more on metabolic health, and it's also on body composition because a time comes when a patient may not lose weight, but that may only be because you know they're they're lean muscle mass is getting better and their fat mass is getting you know. Uh, I mean, the, both their lean muscle mass and their fat mass is getting better. So you don't see a change in weight. And I don't want that to be discouraging for patients. Right? So That's a good point. Yeah. So much of it is about 
making the patient feel successful, the small goals yes. to get you to the bigger goals, accomplishing the small goals first to get you to the bigger goals. And that's a big part of the problem with insulin and sulfonylurea, like you were alluding to, that they cause weight gain. So yes. just helping somebody get off those medications can automatically cause weight loss, even if you're not thinking about it. But most importantly, where is your weight loss happening? Because a lot of these, you know, the the, I guess you could say some of the traditional teaching for type 2 diabetes is a very low calorie, low fat diet that also tends to be lowish in protein. And sure, you can lose weight that way, but you can also lose muscle mass and you can lower your resting metabolic rate. So really focusing on losing weight in the proper way, in a healthier way where you're maintaining your lean body mass um, can be really helpful. Now, one of the big ways to do that is to make sure you're getting adequate protein. And there's mm -hmm. some debate about, well, protein can spike your insulin and raise your blood sugar. So is protein dangerous for people with type 2 diabetes? I, I, I think, by the way, I asked that question. I already played my hand as to what my bias is, but let me hear what you think about that. You know, I, I just want to also mention one more thing about weight loss, oh, if sure. I can. Um, sure. I do tell patients about the set point theory of weight loss. Um, so a time comes when, you know, if their weight is plateaued, it's not. It's because their body is in defense mode right now. And, you know, I give them the thermostat example where I say, you know, if, if you have kept your room at 68 degrees, but now you prefer 65, you know, mm -hmm. everything in that room is going to get you to 68. And that's the same with your weight. So um, losing weight is great. Maintaining weight is important. And, and really focusing on the set point is the most important thing. So during our visits, we look at waist circumference and we look at a set point for patients. Just like how we don't focus on glucose numbers, but target ranges. With weight, I tend to focus on set points and waist circumference. So anyways, I just wanted to mention that um, also. And I, and I think putting that, putting it in a perspective like that for patients can be very beneficial because, because they don't know about, you know, the whole set point thing and how our body, is, you know, I think most people believe if I continue to eat better and I exercise, I should continue losing weight. But as you know, that is not the case. So I am a huge proponent of protein and I, uh, a lot of credit goes to my dietitian who has helped me learn more about protein. And really um, I have, I, I give it a lot of importance because, you know, at the end of the day, in your, in your later decades, strength matters and, you know, you don't want to lose weight at, at the expense of, at the expense of at losing um, your, um, your strength, right? So um, I have not seen the protein rise. Um, and again, I'm, I'm talking about, especially my type two diabetic population. I don't see that. Um, 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 I, if I do see a little bit uh, off the spike, it's, they, they rarely leave the target range, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it might be maybe a minuscule spike and they come back down again. But I think the benefit of being on protein, the importance of starting your meal with protein, prioritizing protein and how it actually helps you with the glucose spike, you know, when you eat the carb following the protein um, is actually much more beneficial than this this um, uh, fear of glucose spiking with protein. Yeah, I think it, this is a perfect example of something where you have mechanistic um, study, mechanistic data, which is true. You can't, you can't um, ignore that the mechanistic data is true. But then when you take that and put it in the clinical context of what the person's doing with their whole meal, their whole lifestyle, their whole diabetes progression, that it really doesn't matter at all in the clinical context, despite that mechanistic. And that, and that that's sort of a disconnect that not everybody sees. That's why I like to get the, the clinical perspective for someone who's been um, involved right. in this for so long and, and uses protein as a, as a tool for benefit rather than a concern. And especially for the patients with uncontrolled diabetes, you know, oftentimes they present with weight loss. And unfortunately, it is the wrong kind of weight loss. You know, they've lost a lot of muscle mass. Um, and so when we get them get, get them back in target, um, you know, protein becomes even more important because in addition to uh, helping, you know, maintain a glycemic profile, we also have to rebuild some of the muscle mass that was lost uh, because of uncontrolled sugars. Yeah, yeah. And now you've mentioned exercise a couple of times. So let me ask you about that because now we've done a couple podcasts here at Diet Doctor about strength training, uh, one about more the aerobic zone two type training, and one about high intensity interval training. So when it comes to exercise for people with type two diabetes, do you have like a concept of which is most important to help them with blood sugar control? Or is it 
do whatever you want to do as long as you're physically active? Great question. So I think the physical activity piece is non-negotiable. And I think I like to separate that from exercise. Um, You know, I tell patients, if if you want to maintain a good level of um, tolerance to carbohydrates, uh, because you are at the end of the day allergic to carbohydrates, but you're also very much allergic to inactivity. So I think I think those two those two become non-negotiable. Where you know you 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 have to get to a point, and I, I can help you get to the point where this just becomes the standard of care. It becomes a part of you. You know that is your identity. You are the person who is physically active, and you are the person who is very um, intentional about carbohydrate intake and does it in a way that does not jeopardize you know the time that you spend out of range. So I think it's good to make that distinction. Uh, and I also, I think it's such an important piece to train patients on using physical activity to lower glucose. It is an infinitely powerful glucose lowering tool than a lot of the medications that we have at our disposal, but it's all about timing. So I think if your glucose is, you know, go, if it has gone up from 140 to 160, it's going to be relatively easy for you to bring it back down as opposed to going from 140 to 240. So I think knowing that physical activity is a key component of your glycemic control is is very, very important. Having said that, with exercise, um, you know, we talk a lot about exercise based on um, what the patient's goals are. I think strength conditioning is very, very important. And it's, um, I think it's underappreciated. And I also am a very big fan of zone two training. So, you know, if I have a patient who is very much interested in um, fat burning, staying in fat burning, who wants to continue losing inches, we do talk a lot about uh, zone two training with them. Uh, But I think it also needs to be paired with strength training. But again, this is where Wearables are very important. So we do have patients wear some kind of a tracking device where they can see if they're, they're, if they're exercising, are they, are they spending their time in zone two or not, for example. And then with the strength conditioning piece, I think it's also important to make sure that you get that protein at the end of your strength conditioning session as well. You know, so um, so uh, those are challenging challenging things for patients to accomplish, but it's it's possible. And maybe even starting with just functional training for a lot of patients that are just having difficulty just getting getting up, you know, from the couch, you know, sitting up. I think once they notice that when their strength come back, uh, when, when their strength is coming back, how great they feel, I think that is going to fuel that change more and more. Yeah, I think that's a great, great point you made, um, multiple great points. But the point of, of someone who hasn't exercised at all, if they think that bar is that they have to do an hour of, of zone two or they have to do a high intensity interval training, then they're never going to start. But if you're talking about just get started with functional training and and just, again, that, that small milestone to then get you going further down the road, get started with something. I think that makes a lot of sense. And we've got a, a course called Let's Get Moving Design oh. for Beginning uh, people are beginning with physical activity to really get them started for exactly that reason. Cause you, oh, you really have I to can't start wait to do it. <laughs> I'm, I mean, maybe I'll do it right after this interview. <laughs> very good. Very good. Well, I, you know, I think this has been a wonderful discussion, both for clinicians and for the average individual or patient with type two diabetes or who knows someone with type two diabetes to really get your perspective um, on the way type two diabetes treatment should be. So let's bring this back to the beginning then. Do you think it's time that your teacher can stand up there and say the goal for everybody with type 2 diabetes is to put the disease in remission and reverse the disease process and get you off all medications? Has the time come to say that? Absolutely. I think that the number one goal is to not get our patients off the wrong foot. All right. So I think that I did, I was guilty of that myself. I think by me prescribing the wrong medications, I was taking my patients farther and farther away from uh, from being able to reverse the diabetes. So I think if we can just start there, where we make just where we make certain medications like blacklisted medications, I think would be great. Um, I think the second goal, especially for those patients that are taking some of these medications, um, maybe giving them a tool like a continuous glucose monitor and 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 just sort of testing the waters, you know, for a week, um, seeing how how their diabetes responds to a very strict low carb diet and and then using that as a foundational piece and sort of working working to the next part and i think nobody probably would argue that that would be a bad idea right i mean 
one week, it's it's almost like a test. I mean, in, in, in the field of endocrinology, whenever there is excess of something, we always do a deprivation test. And, you know, when there is less of a hormone, we do a stimulation test. So how is this any different from that, right? But but I think at the end of the day, the, the test is going to reveal a lot of valuable pieces of data and answer a lot of questions, both for the provider and the patient. So I think just sort of stopping at an A1C is not enough. I think we need to dig deeper and we need to find that blueprint. And, and, and I'm just so fortunate that I am dealing with a disease where I can exactly do that. I mean, what other disease exists out there that has this continual feed of data that I can look at and I can measure and I can, you know, sort of see how how it changes with all the decisions that a patient just makes. So why not take advantage of all the tools that we have? And they're cost effective, they're affordable, and they are very easy to interpret. You don't have to go to any, you know, specialty training for that, right? I'm just very fortunate and I'm honored that you gave me an opportunity to share my experience and my journey with everyone. Thank you. Oh, I'm so happy to have you on. Yeah. I mean, you're just, you're such a delight to talk to and, and your perspective is fantastic. So people are going to really enjoy this episode.